Hey, everybody. This is Hondo Carpenter from Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation Raiders Today part. And this is our Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast, part of the Fans First Sports Network as well, where you can catch us and get us. Matt Halatic is with us like he is every week, the editor and publisher of the spun.com. Matt, this week in our podcast, we got a lot of ground to cover. We're just literally hours. Obviously, there's a couple days, but hours from the NFL draft. I'll be at the Raiders facility all four days for the entire draft. And today we're going to discuss things I'm hearing about the NFL draft. So we're going to get into all that. We're going to have a good time. Good to have you, bud. I can't believe we are right here on the precipice of another draft together. Always a pleasure to be on with you. And and this is a fun time of the year. Now, I want to run home to see I'm cheating. I got my notes here because I got a lot of notes. I mean, I have been working the phones. So I'm going to start first by talking about Devin Witherspoon and Christian Gonzalez. Um, I talked to a lot of NFL teams, and it's amazing to me. They have them 1A and 1B, and there is not consistently any one over the other. So I think this is interesting. Now, to me, that is really intriguing. And I'm going to tell you how they're describing both guys to me, and then we're going to discuss it. Christian Witherspoon is the quintessential NFL corner. Put him out there, shutdown guy. And this is how one general manager explained him to me last night, though. He said, but Devin Witherspoon is the same, but he's got a little hot sauce. He goes, he's a, you know, he goes, not many corners love to go up and hit. Witherspoon does. He says, Christian Gonzalez has all the skills. He goes, I'd be thrilled. He goes, I don't think either one of them is even going to be close to me when we pick. He said, but I would take either one of them. 1A, 1B. Those are his words. He said, but Witherspoon, he just got a little bit of hot sauce. And so I'm a little bit surprised um, because Devin Witherspoon, everyone thought he was securely number two coming in. But he's up there, and this general manager told me if I and and this is a successful franchise, that's why they're picking so low. He said, if I had to make the pick and they were both on the board, I'm taking Witherspoon. And so talking to other guys, some of them told me Gonzalez, others told me Witherspoon, but they all agreed with him. One A, one B, and there really isn't who's A and who's B. What are your thoughts on that? It's funny because I think a couple of weeks ago when we talked about your mock, you had the Raiders taking Witherspoon at seven. I remember saying, I think it's a a good fit for them. I personally would lean a little bit more towards Gonzalez, but I can understand why teams are looking at them as kind of 1A and 1B. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, I I expect to see at least one of them off the board in the top 10 picks. And I think that you could easily see both come off the board uh, in the top half of the first round, definitely, because uh, there's going to be – I'm expecting probably four or five corners to go first round. I think that you'll – towards the back half, you'll get Joey Porter, uh, Deontay Banks, um, maybe Emmanuel Forbes, guys like that. So I think the run on corners starts a little early. I think you'll see both those guys get picked in the first, you know, 10 to 15 picks. Yeah, I agree with you. I think they're both – early, early picks. And I, again, I, I just think it's fascinating the way those two have gone. Now I've written about this. We've, you and I have been doing podcasts and radio together for what, 12 years now. I think it is. Yeah, I think it's 10, 12. It's a while. Yeah. And you and I've talked about this for years where general managers and NFL executives have told me, you know, too many teams it's paralysis by analysis. And but they've also told me you traditionally see the same teams picking at the top because they consistently make mistakes. So Jalen Carter comes into this and Jalen Carter uh, had a horrible pro day, horrible pro day. There were other concerns with him off the field, but the pro day is the one that hurt a lot of people. I still think he's going in the top 10. He has dropped for sure. Many people believe if you look just at raw God-given talent, he's the best player in this draft. And But the fact of the off the field and everything else, he's dropping. I know teams 
that don't have that that have told me we would not select him in the second round. Just those are too high of picks. We would trade up and take him with the first pick in the third, but we're not going to touch him in the first two. But I do believe he's going to go in the first round. I do think he's going to go in the top 10 because I think there's going to be in talking to manage NFL general managers and executives. Somebody is just going to fall in love with them and say, gee, I can fix that and go up and take a huge risk with Jalen Carter. But I do think he goes in the top 10. Your thoughts. I would agree. I know that, you know, it, it seems like one of those things where a guy he's talked about as potential number one pick. Then you see the obvious concerns. He starts to slide. And we're getting, you know, talk of him sliding late into the first, out of the first, all these different things. I think when it comes ultimately time for the draft, I think some of that will work its way back in the opposite direction where I think he does get taken in the top 10. And here's an interesting scenario. If he's slipping lower in the top 10, what about a team like Philly with the 10th pick that already has – couple of Georgia guys on that roster, young Georgia defenders and Jordan Davis and the Kobe Dean, would they take a Jalen Carter, who's probably the best player available, and say, hey, you know, we believe in the talent. Maybe there's some things that we need to work around or work out, but we feel we have the the support system, the culture to make to make it work and to bring out the best in him. I think that would be a, a fascinating pick if he made it to 10 um, but I fully expect him to be gone within the top 10. Yeah, interesting time there. Now, I'm going to make another prediction, and I have felt this for a long time, but sometimes you got to just keep your mouth shut. But I'm predicting Will Levis goes before C.J. Stroud, and C.J.'s gone down on some boards. I know there was some stuff about some scores on tests. I don't think that helped him, but I don't think that hurt him. C.J. Stroud had an amazing game against Georgia, which give him all the credit in the world. He killed it. But go back and watch the Michigan game. You know, the first one when they played in Ann Arbor. Uh, that was not a good performance by him. Then there's some other games against lesser teams where he didn't really show up. Um, okay, great. You played awesome against Georgia. But in the NFL – you got to play 17 games at your very highest level. There has to be that consistency, and it, and it wasn't there. I know there's been a lot of hype for C.J. Stroud. I don't think he's a bad quarterback. I'm not saying that. But I want to go back to what I told you at our first podcast during this draft season. Multiple guys told me there isn't one quarterback in this class that we think is a can't miss the closest is Bryce young. Everybody feels that way, but all the rest are question marks. Will Levis is a guy who consistently people have told me, love him, love him. I had one general manager say to me, there's nothing about him. I don't like. And I said, well, do you view him like you viewed Bryce young? No, but how do you view him compared to everyone else? Better. So would that surprise you? knowing how this draft season is gone, if my prediction's correct, and Will Levis goes before C.J. Stroud? It wouldn't surprise me, I think, if we get the scenario where Bryce Young goes one, which I think everyone's pretty much expecting at this point. The Texans either don't pick a quarterback at two or someone trades up with them to get to it. I could see if that's the case your scenario playing out because if if the Texans sit at two and don't take a quarterback and then the Cardinals are at three and they're committed to Kyler Murray that means that you're you go young two non-quarterbacks and a quarterback at four to the Colts Colts have been kind of the team of mystery everybody knows they're taking a quarterback I've seen mocks with them getting and I've seen mocks with them getting Richardson. I've seen mocks with them getting Will Levis. I've seen mocks with them getting C.J. Stroud. It all would come down to the Colts there and how do they view the, the, those quarterbacks. But other than you know, I could it's a scenario I could see playing out because other than Bryce Young going one, I don't know if I feel totally comfortable saying linking a quarterback to a, a specific team beyond that because you know there's always possibility of trades and there's so many teams 
clustered together there that need a quarterback or would be looking for a quarterback. All right. Next, I'm going to make this prediction that there are going to be five quarterbacks taken in the first round. Hendon Hooker is there. And I'm going to tell you this. I would not be shocked if Hendon Hooker isn't the fifth. I think he could jump some other guys. Again, talking to a lot of people in the league, um, several of them told me if Hendon Hooker had not been injured, that they think it would be him and Bryce Young, 1A, 1B. Um, now, they said clearly Bryce Young would be 1A, but that Hooker would not have been you know, far behind at 1B. And he's worked hard. People expect him to be ready by training camp. Would it surprise you with five quarterbacks, and would it shock you if Hendon Hooker wasn't the fifth? It would would not surprise me if there were five quarterbacks taken. I think it's probably a pretty good chance of that because a team towards the back end of the first round would either look to take a a, a flyer on a handed hooker or if another one of the big four big four falls to to make a move there. Would it surprise me if he is not the fifth? Oh, that's a tough question. I, you it's know, a good question isn't it? Because I, I think that we've we've already established that. I, I think you know Bryce Young is one. Someone will take T.J. Stroud early because he's a safe pick. Mm-hmm. Now you're thinking of does somebody does Levis go before him, or does someone you know say swing big for Anthony Richardson, or are they kind of down on both of them and think that hooker is even though he's got his some red flags in his own right is he a little safer than both i would say it would surprise me a little bit if he's not the fifth guy but i do think five guys in the first round is a distinct possible all right now i want to just change the direction just a teeny bit with you because i think this is is a fascinating scenario what would you say if i told you i've only had one person tell me this but early this morning. Now, we're taping this early on Monday morning, 6 a.m. and where I live in Las Vegas, 9 a.m. on the East Coast on Monday morning. I was on the phone this morning at about 8.45, just before we got on air, um, with a guy who told me he's hearing rumors. He didn't tell me which name. I think we could probably figure it out. But he's hearing that there could be a sixth quarterback taken in the first round. Just because if a team really believes in a guy, if you go up and get him in the sixth round, then he could get that five-year option on his contract. And again, his words, the, you know, those of us picking at the bottom are usually at the bottom because we know how to draft. This could be another team looking to move up who's not traditionally a good drafting team to get a guy. Would it shock you if I said there is a potential – of six quarterbacks being taken in the first round. That blew me out of the water. I still, I, to me, I would lean towards that being a little bit more of just kind of the, you know, the silly season that you kind of hear stuff right, leading right up to the draft where you always hear kind of like some kind of like some major rumors that shock you and they may not come to fruition. Um I, listen, there are a couple of guys who are intriguing, I think, beyond those first five. We've talked about Tanner McKee a lot, uh, Jake Hayner from Fresno State. Um, you know, there's a couple other guys that, that have been mentioned a, as possibilities. Um, Clayton Toon from Houston. I can't see a team using a first-round pick on one of those guys. I know the fifth-year option is tempting, but it would really surprise me if six quarterbacks went. Hey, and I want to make it clear. I'm not predicting that. And, and, but he was telling me, um, he knows for facts some calls have been made to some more teams about the possibility of moving up. So I, I just, you know, he, did he tell me it was his team? No, but his team's picking in that bottom part of the first round. And he told me he knows for a fact. So that I found that fascinating. Um, here is another thing that, that I I found really interesting about this draft. What do you think of the quarterback out of TCU? Big Max. This is a guy that 
I'm hearing a lot of talk about him. This is a guy that's proven, done it. Your thought on him? He, to me, is a day three guy. Three you know, guy. he's a, he's not going to be somebody you count on to play right away. But, you know, you look at the intangibles he brings. Um, well, the tangibles he brings outside of – not that he's a bad passer, but he's a dual-threat guy, great runner. The intangibles he brings in terms of toughness, leadership, you know, I – putting his body on the line like he did in the college football playoff. Um, he's a kid who I think whether he gets drafted late or doesn't get picked and is a priority free agent has a chance to stick around the league for a while um, because of what he'll bring to the table, not just with his skill set, but what he'll bring to a quarterback room um, with preparation, with, you know, the intangible stuff that teams like to have in their QB three or maybe QB two, if he becomes a backup. I'm going to tell you, let me tell you the reason I bring his name up. I asked all my friends starting last night and into today, who's this year's Brock Purdy? Mm -hmm. A guy that could, could could go Mr. Irrelevant, a guy who's going to go late that you think could end up surprising everybody. And every one of them said Big Max. I thought that was pretty fascinating to me. All right. It is. And I think it's a kid, like I said, he's a kid who has proved himself, especially last year or so. Yeah. So now I want to talk about the Raiders. Um, I, I, nobody does it as good as Berman. I don't even know why I try. Wow. I just, I love it when Berman goes Raiders. All right. I believe if they use number seven overall, outside of defense, my thought's going to be, what are you thinking? Now, I love this. Because my job as a reporter is to, I, 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 I'm very clear when I'm giving opinion. And so I'll have people just rip my ass for on Twitter, which on everything else. I can't believe that you, you know, you, you had them picking this guy. You're so stupid. You need to just stick to reporting. Well, guess what, genius? I'm telling you what I'm hearing from other NFL people. Raiders need defense. And that first pick, they're going to have a shot at some great defensive players. And I'm going to get into, before I start talking about their actual pick, I just want to tell you, I would not be shocked, and I think this is going to blow your brain, if Tyree Wilson gets picked before Will Kim, I mean, Will Anderson. And I'm hearing a ton of talk about Tyree Wilson, a ton of talk of what people love about him. And I'm going to share some of this. And I'm going to get your analysis. A lot of teams, Will Anderson's a can't miss. He's considered a dude. There are two guys in this draft that everyone says, you know, great character guys. There's not character issues. They're going to come in. They're going to step in. They're going to play. They're immediate guys that you pick at the top. Will Anderson and uh, Tyree Wilson. A lot of guys say Jalen Carter may have the most talent, but there's too many question marks. These two guys. But I'm starting to hear a lot of guys that I respect who aren't going to be picking high, so they don't mind telling me. I think Tyree Wilson could go ahead of them, and here's why. They both have the high motor in practice, which is what Max Crosby, the Raiders, has. They both are guys they don't think will be impacted by the money. But – Will Anderson, you know what you got. He's great. He's already polished. He's ready. Tyree Wilson hasn't had the best coaching. He's not as polished. And they look at him and say, man, with a little polish, I think he's even better than Will Anderson. Again, I'm not yet. I'm 50-50 who goes first. So I'm not predicting Tyree does, but it would not shock me at all. Would it shock you if Tyree Wilson went ahead of, of uh, Will Anderson? It wouldn't. I know that we've talked about, you know, this paralysis by analysis type stuff, and it does feel okay. like Will Anderson has been, you know, nitpicked more leading up to the draft because he came in with such a high reputation uh, go going into the 2022 season, let alone after the 2022 season ended. Um, but it wouldn't shock me because I think that, like you said, there's two fundamental ways of kind of looking at how when you're drafting, do you want to take the biggest swing possible and say, look, this guy isn't where we want him to be yet, but we think we can get him to a point where he's even better than the stud, the other, the other stud that's available, which would be Will Anderson. Or do you say, Will Anderson's going to, he's going to be a knockout pick. 
he's going to be a guy who you plug and play for a decade and you know he's going to be he's a very good player let's just go that route um it really depends on you know what teams are, are thinking about each player but i do think that there's a few spots that make sense for both of those guys i think when you look if the texans don't take a quarterback well then obviously at two if they stay put they'll probably take one of those two guys um the cardinals would make a lot of sense to take one of those two guys and start to rebuild that defense. The Seahawks, they're picking early because they have the Broncos pick. Um, Pete Carroll could look to add an impact defender. I think Tyree Wilson or Willingness should be right up his alley. So I think it wouldn't surprise me if you see both of them go in the top five. Um, and depending on which one goes first is, is all about a philosophy of a team that's drafting. Yeah, agree. All right. So to the Raiders, here's ideally what you're looking at. There are four top defenders, Witherspoon, Gonzalez, Tyree, Anderson. They walk away with any of those four. It was a great first round for the Raiders. But ideally, I think the best scenario for the Raiders, and I believe this is what they want to do, is trade out of seven. If they're able to trade out of seven, they have 12 picks, but they have a lot of needs. And this is a team that wants to build by the draft. They're a team that will let the draft come to them. I know that that they said recently, oh, we haven't ruled out moving up. I don't see any scenario that they move up um, higher than five. I would give you a different thing. If teams above five change their asking price, then I could see the Raiders. But based on what the asking price is now, I don't see anyone. I don't see them going up above five. Again, if they do, it's going to be because some teams lowered their asking price. But I think ideally the Raiders are like, yeah, there's four really good players there. But this is such a deep draft. Now, not in certain positions. So, for example, I was told by several guys. Uh, there's only one wide receiver in this entire first round that we think's first round gradable, and that is the Ohio State kid. That's the only one. Now, we know there's going to be more than one wide receiver taken, but the teams that I talk to who are traditionally great drafting teams, only one had a first round rating. Only one running back with a first round rating. Bijan Robinson, obviously, out of Texas. So when you start looking at it and you know corner deep in this draft, I mean uh, uh, tight end, excuse me, deep in this draft, there are several positions that are deep in this draft. So you start looking at it and say, okay, as you're the Raiders, I need a lot of help. There's just going to be a really good draft going a long ways deep. There may not be a lot of dudes, which means, you know, that Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson at the top, plug and you know pick and plug and play but there's a lot of great players at this level so i'm going to ask you in your dream scenario who's the pick for the raiders or is it a trade down because to me it's a trade down well i think my dream scenario if i'm the raiders would be you mentioned one of those four guys if there's any way that will anderson ever fill a seven i think that's a no-brainer you take him i don't think he's going to um i act like i said i think both those pass rushers are probably going to be off the board when it comes time for the Raiders to pick. In that case, you're looking at both cornerbacks being there. Um, but I think that would be a good scenario for the Raiders. They get one of those two cornerbacks. I think a, another scenario that would be a dream scenario for the Raiders is if one or two of the quarter the quarterbacks, the big-name quarterbacks, fall, and it's not one of the – you said there's one guy in the draft that they would take at seven or consider moving up to five for. If he is not one of the guys that drops, let's say two of, two of the big four do drop, then you're going to have teams looking to move up. And now your number seven pick becomes a premium asset, and you could trade out and you could really um, make some hay in terms of picking up some additional draft capital there. Because, like you said, there are the two cornerbacks, Witherspoon and Gonzalez, are, are excellent prospects. But you can move back in the first round 
and still get there's a there's going to be three or four other first round caliber corners available. Um, and then you get into this, even the second round on Friday night, and there's going to be a bunch taken. Corner is one of the deeper positions in this draft. Um, you'll be they'll be able to find some impact linebackers probably on day two. So I think that the dream scenario would be if Will Anderson ever fell to seven, you get him. I could see them taking Tyree Wilson if Tyree Wilson's at seven. But as good as those two cornerbacks are, I would be really tempted to trade out if those are the two guys that are left on your board. It's going to be fun. All right, Henry Tuo Tuo. <laughs> and again, every week I bring this dude up. I, I I know the Raiders have spent a ton of time checking this guy out. He is just versatile. He just produces. That's a guy. Now, I'm going to ask you, if you had to pick one player in this draft, not for the Raiders, just one player that you think is going to shock a lot of people next year in year one as a rookie, who do you pick? You know, I don't necessarily – This, I don't think it's going to be – a. when I say a shock, I don't think it's going to be a guy who people don't know is good because this guy, people know this guy is good. But I think this is a guy who's getting kind of overthought and I'm surprised at how far he's kind of dropped in terms of at least what the media and some mocks are saying. We'll see if what is on draft night. But I think people are overthinking Michael Mayer, the tight end at Notre Dame. I think that he is going to step in and be – look, he's not Travis Kelsey as a receiver or someone like that or even, you know, Darren Waller as a receiver. But he's a really good re- receiving threat, great inline blocker, can, can do a number of different things. I think he's going to step in and be a 10, 12-year starter in the league. Okay, now I'm going to give you one. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. This one's going to blow your mind a little bit. But everybody I talk to tells me this. There's one guy they expect to start from day one and to be an all-pro. And obviously, Will Anderson, those guys, they expect them all to start. Mm -hmm. But this is a guy they expect to be be a starter and an all-pro year one. Cody Mock, North Dakota (laughs) State University. Man, everybody loves this guy. They just think he is the real deal. The only concern is the fact of the competition level at North Dakota State. But clearly it hasn't hurt some guys who've had some great careers in the NFL so far. But again, this morning talking to a buddy of mine that's picking late, he said, Cody won't get past us. He goes, now, who knows if somebody else slips? You, you never know. He goes, but I don't see an, a, a scenario with us that Cody Mock gets past us. He goes, that's a you put him at guard and you leave him alone. And you come back in 10 years and say, great, thanks for playing. We're retiring your jersey. What do you think of Cody Mock? I would agree. I think we've talked about him a bunch of times in here. I think he's a plug and play guy. He's, he's a guy that would fit in great with the Raiders. Um either in the second round or if they traded back in the first and had a leader first round pick, they could get him there. Um, I think he's a guy who, like you said, you, you put him in a, in a spot on the interior on your offensive line. You don't really think about him. I think he establishes himself right away. And I think he becomes a really, really solid pro. Uh, I think the floor for Cody mock is really high. I think he, he is at the very least going to be a, a solid pro and he could be, you know, a pro ball, all pro talent, like you said, too, when all said and done. All right. Now I'm going to ask you about Kalija Canty. This is a defensive tackle from Pittsburgh that, man, everybody loves. My buddy, again, I talked to this morning, really loves Mock, really loves Kalija Canty as well. That's why if somebody, you know, how guys fall. But, man, a lot of people love Kalija Canty. I would love to see the Raiders be able to trade down. Get a bunch of picks, grab Kalijah Kansi, grab Cody Mock. Man, those are two guys that be. But what do you think of Kalijah Kansi? Because, man, everybody loves him. There's no character concerns at all. No, I mean, I've known this kid a long time. No character concerns. High motor, takes coaching, great kid. What is your thoughts on Kalijah Kansi? I, I think he would be, uh, before you said, I was thinking he would be almost an ideal kind of trade down target for the Raiders. 
Um, I think obviously as you, if he falls into the twenties, like we're saying, I'm seeing some mock drafts projecting, uh, there's a n- number of teams there, uh, probably starting with Minnesota around 23, that would love to to draft him. I think he's a guy that you bring in and he gives you a little bit of, of, with of both sides of the ball right away. He can defend the run, but he also can find a way to press the pocket from the interior. I think he'll be uh, a contributor from day one. And like you said, he's a guy that you don't have to worry about off the field. You don't have to worry about adapting to the NFL uh, and how he'll fit in your program. So uh, I think that he is going to make a team very happy in mid to late first round. Tell you what, my dream scenario, and I say dream, I'm not a fan, but my, as what I think would be a dream for the Raiders, trade down and get a haul. Still have a bunch of quarterbacks there at seven. Get a haul, get Kalija Canty, turn right around and get Cody Mock. Man, there are two, because this is what everybody forgets. Yeah, quarterback's the most important position, no doubt. But they went and got Jimmy Garoppolo, so clearly they're not worried about injury. So you go get him an offensive lineman stud that's going to start day one, and you get a defensive lineman that's going to start day one. You get two immediate starters with high level on rookie deals. Man, if that's the case, they're building statues. They won't, but they're building statues to Dave Ziegler outside of Allegiant Stadium. And listen, uh, you know, in the NFL and in any level of football, your your quarterback raises your ceiling. Your elite quarterbacks, your your ceiling's high through the roof. Your line, especially your offensive line, but your defensive line too, your two lines raise your floor. If your sound of the interior, if your sound up front on both sides of the ball, you're going to compete in almost every game. Um, you may not, you're not going to win every game. You may not be, you know, a top tier team, depending on what your quarterback's like and your skill position guys. But if your sound in the middle of your offense, the middle of your defense, you're going to be in pretty much every game. And that's the quickest way to raise your floor uh, in the NFL. Totally agree. He's the one and only the great Matt Holatic from the spun.com. Matt, hang with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Now, you'll be back next week. We're going to break down the entire draft, and then we're going to do another podcast that week just breaking down the Raiders picks. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks, Matt. Anytime. Check them out at thespun.com.